everybody and um, welcome to our Saturday evening here at the Labs Big Weekend. We're just thrilled and delighted to have a very, very special guest with us this evening, uh, the one and only Deke Sharon. A big hello to you, Deke. Thanks for joining us um, this evening. Um, for those of you who might not know Deke, um, he really is kind of like, you know, the, the Mr. Acapella, I think we could say, couldn't we? You know, singer, arranger, composer, director, producer, teacher, and really one of the leaders of acapella music around the world. Um, if you're a Pitch Perfect fan, uh, you may or may or may not know that Deke was the arranger, musical director and vocal producer for all three films. And you may also remember him from the TV series Pitch Battle, where choirs from all over the UK um, competed for the top spot. That was a great show. We love that. Um, and last year you came over for the Sweet Hannah Lines Education Symposium, didn't you? So you got yes. to meet some, you got to meet some uh, nutty UK barbershoppers then. Um, so he's here with us today to share his incredible knowledge um, about expressing a unified emotion across a quartet or chorus. So Deke's really keen for you to pop questions in the chat as you go, um, and he'll keep an eye on the chat. And if you've got any other specific questions, pop them in and we'll make sure we bring them to Deke's attention. So Deke, thanks again for being here. It's just fantastic. So over to you. You're so kind and I'm so glad to be here. This is as close as I can get to England right now without being in England. And I should mention a uh, caveat to uh, anybody who's watching this from around the world. I do have a special affinity for, for all of Great Britain because uh, I, I did the Ancestry.com DNA test a while ago. And each time they revise the results, I become more and more purely uh, British, Welsh, Irish, Scottish, like just boom, right up there. Uh, I know I've got some, a little bit of German and, and Viking blood in me, but apparently that is all getting winnowed out by the Ancestry.com people. So my heart is in Great Britain right now. I'm drinking my English breakfast tea. I'm uh, enjoying, I have uh, everything here to make a proper uh, English breakfast except for bubble and squeak. I'm gonna have to figure out how to slaughter my own hogs so I'm able to make that happen. Anyway, all of that is beside the point. What I wanna talk about today is the heart of vocal harmony. This um, topic is uh, close to my heart because I would work with groups for decades all around the world and uh, they bring me in to coach them. And the first question uh, that I would ask them after they would sing a song for me is I would say, okay, so what is the point here? What are you going for? What's the goal? What's the mood? What's the message? And I would so often be met with blank faces and stares. Oh, um, well, we didn't talk about it or uh, well, I mean, this is kind of a love song, so I guess maybe love. And the thing that that was so clear to me is that each choir, each chorus, each acapella group, each quartet uh, was really trying to focus on being technically perfect without necessarily sharing a message. And this is uh, problematic for so many reasons, but most of all because music and especially vocal music is a conduit for emotional expression. It's a connection between the performer and the audience that is a heightened level of communication, particularly emotional communication. And yet if the people in your ensemble don't know what they're expressing, there's a problem. Moreover, it's too often the case that there are a, gr a group of people who want to express emotion and they feel emotion deeply and they know what they're trying to get to and yet the entirety of their choral music education has been about notes and rhythms and timing and tuning and blend and all these technical aspects. But when it comes down to expressing emotion in a unified manner, they just don't really know how to do that. Um, and so let me start this talk and uh, go through a number of the different points that are in the book. Now, the entire time I'm talking, please feel free to go ahead and, and post any questions you have in the chat. Um, and I'll try to address them as they scroll up, uh, you know, comments, questions. I really do like having a dialogue back and forth. And then at the end, if there's some time, we will have some general questions and conversation about whatever you would like to. Uh, but let me start by, by using an analogy that I think is probably the most powerful of all which is uh, the Aesop's fable of the wind and the sun, which um, for those of you that don't remember it, the wind and the sun uh, are trying to 
trying to jostle for power and and they just had to make a bet on who is more powerful they see a man walking down the street with his coat on and uh, the decision is whoever can get that coat off the person is the stronger so the wind decides i'm going to go first howls and blows and pushes and no matter how hard the wind is blowing the man just holds the coat stronger around himself and then the sun finally says it's not working my turn and the clouds part and the sun comes out and the gentle rays of the sun come out and the person takes off his own coat. And the reason uh, for that analogy, I think will become clear as we go through this process, but I want you to keep that image in your mind as the best way to evoke and elicit emotion from yourself and others in your group. Um, so uh, before we go much further, and I uh, alluded to it beforehand, how many of you in your choirs growing up, in your choruses focused primarily on emotion? I think almost none. And in fact, it was at best a passing comment all the way through my music career and uh, experience in, in the conservatory. Everything was about technique. Everything was about precision. Everything was about uh, purpose of, of um, musicianship, shall we say. But uh, I think there is, particularly in vocal music, a chip that's on many shoulders because instrumentalists press a button and they're in tune, whereas uh, singers, vocalists, we are basically a fretless instrument. And moreover, um, it's too often that the instrumentalists see themselves as being musicians and they call us just singers. And they think that we don't necessarily have the same level of technique, knowledge, ability, and uh, we're kind of pushed aside as being serious musicians. And as a result, so many choral educators, so many directors are trying to prove their technical ability and the, te the technical prowess and perfection of the choirs and the forest gets lost for the trees and emotions push to the wayside. Um, now, I, the thing that I want to make sure that everybody walks away with is that whenever you are performing, you need to make sure you are saying something. It is not enough to just be about technique. There needs to be some kind of an, an emotional message and core that you're focusing at and focusing on. A North Star that everything else focuses towards. Every dynamic choice, every rhythm, every phrasing, your, your blend, your vowels, all of these things, if they're in purpose of that goal of what you want to communicate to the audience, they will lock together in, 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 in powerful step. Uh, and the thing also that it's important to remember is that we have a harder task than pretty much any other form of expression um, because we need to have a singularity of emotion. If you think about it, a bunch of actors on stage, each person is in their own character. And if there's a surprise, you know, think about one of those, those fun murder mysteries or whatever, each person's got their own reaction to the gun going off or, or to the, the detective explaining something. Um, they're all in their own moment and in their own character. And whereas our singers on stage definitely still want to have their own personalities, it doesn't make sense for each one of them to have vastly different emotions. You can't have one person be joyful and another person be angry and another person be sad because it sends a, a great deal of disconnect unless you're actually doing some kind of a musical theater piece with people in different characters. You need there to be a singularity of emotional expression. And this is particularly challenging uh, because if you imagine a, a line of hamlets across the front of the stage, not only are we trying to get everybody to, to, to say to be or not to be in perfect rhythm and timing together, but we also want them to phrase it together and to be saying the same thing at the same time. That is extremely difficult. And that's the reason I decided to research and write this book, The Heart of Vocal Harmony, to try to figure out how do we do this? What is this technique? And where can we learn uh, how to get the best combination of elements together? So that's what we're gonna work on. Um, now, uh, laying the groundwork before we go into specific techniques, let me make sure that uh, a couple things are clear if they're not obvious. Number one is you can't really have you know, any kind of, of, of emotional openness unless you have a measure of internal harmony within your group. Uh, if there's strife, if there's disconnect, if people are not um, gelling, if people are not looking at each other, if they're frustrated with each other, the music too often is going to be about that. Or there's not going to be that magic and connection and openness that's going to, that they're going to feel comfortable expressing difficult emotions. So you need to make sure that you have internal per, interpersonal harmony in your group to be able to create great vocal harmony. That's 
that's a baseline. And I think everybody probably knows that. But I mentioned it because particularly in a smaller ensemble like a quartet, you've got to keep those lines of communication open and you've got to make sure that you are all uh, willing and able to bear your hearts and, and, and say the difficult things, share the challenging emotions and moments. That's where the magic ends up getting made. Um, people need to feel safe to be able to be open. And also the, 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 the facial interconnectedness between people, the most magical moments that end up happening in, in, in any vocal harmony performance, be it a small ensemble, a quartet, or an acapella group, or even in a choir, are those moments where you see a couple of people meet eyes across the room, and there's just this electricity, and then they turn and share it out with the audience. You need that connection between your singers to be able to have those kind of moments happen. All right, so before we go much further, let me make sure that you know what the, the playing field is, what these tools are that we're working with. Um, scientists have been doing some research into human emotion recently. And uh, if you've, any of you have seen the Pixar movie Inside Out with uh, the character and then um, you know, the 11 year old girl and then the different characters in her head, there's anger and joy and fear and sadness. And, and um, there, there were uh, at that time, seven core emotions were what, what scientists believed the human experience based and then everything else was built up on top of that. Um, the movie has five of them in it, but it turns out since then they've really whittled it down to four. Four core emotions that are really the primary colors of our emotional experience and everything else is built up on top of it um, with, with intermingled emotions and other experiences and thoughts that, that build up on top of them. These, these primary emotions of color are joy, anger, fear, and sadness. These are the emotions that are like hardwired into our medulla oblongata, our reptilian brain. And that's also sadly why um, so much uh, political discourse is really aiming at anger and fear because those are such powerful core animal emotions and instincts that we have. Um, they motivate us greatly. And of course there's sadness, which interconnects people. Um, and of course, there's joy when everything's humming and moving really smoothly. Um, and emotional complexity really comes as, an, as a mixture of these. You know, a bittersweet uh, moment might be joy and sadness together. You have this memory of a time and, and it's, it's complicated, right? Um, and you, they say that surprise is both, you know, fear, and joy mixed together. You're like, ah, what's, you know, what's going on? You're like, you're, you know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of, a lot of rock and roll, for instance, is, is some kind of combination between like anger and joy. Like you think about that, uh, you know, that, that uh, kind of energy. So what you're going to find is that these core emotions are going to pretty quickly with experiences woven into them, uh, extrapolate out and spin into a wide range of different emotions that you'll feel. Um, so if we have at our core an understanding that we want to get our singers on stage to share emotion in a unified manner, and we want it to be consistent as well. Uh, think about that Tuesday rehearsal where everybody just clicks and it's magical and it's fantastic, but then you do the performance on Saturday and it's just not there. So this isn't only about deciding that you want emotion to be the, the, the North Star that's driving everything that you're doing and that's gonna connect you with the audience. And it's not just enough to make sure that you get all of your singers to understand what a song means, but you also have to make sure that you have a way to make it happen every single time you perform. And that's where the consistency comes in. So first and foremost, song choice plays a huge role in, in making sure that you have a great unified emotional experience. Um, the appropriateness of a song is really important. It doesn't make a lot of sense for a bunch of kids to sing Still Crazy after all these years, for instance, right? You, you want to choose music that is understood and believable and in the wheelhouse, if you will, of your singers. Something that you together communally can communicate and speak on, right? Issues that are yours, topics that are things that you've experienced. Um, also, if a song has a solo, a lead vocal, you really want to make sure that that person who's the conduit for your message understands and believes that song. In, in the case of a barbershop quartet, of course, you're talking about the lead. And, and the, the song has to resonate with everyone, but if they're really going to be telling the story, you want to make sure that this song is theirs in a way. 
Um, and, and we'll talk about in, in a bit how a song might not be an experience that they've specifically had, but it has to be one that they're able to relate to and put themselves in the shoes of that. Um, then when we're talking about song choice, all of your choices around the presentation, you know, what you're going to wear, how you're going to stand on stage, what movement you'll have, and the arrangement, uh, how you're going to be putting together these notes, either if you're arranging it yourselves or you have somebody from the outside arrange it, all of these choices should be made based upon what that core meaning of the song is to you. And let's talk about that. How do you really figure out what a song means? Well, first of all, look at the historical context of the song. What did it mean at its time? And I don't only mean the lyrics of that song, but also the overarching circumstances in which it existed. So for instance, if we're talking about lyrical analysis, there are a lot of songs of unrequited love from the Great American Songbook, right? Great musicals and, and whatever. But if you go back and you look at the songwriters themselves, there's, there's a sadness and a, and a bitterness and a darkness within those songs that really uh, in previous generations wasn't understood because it's uh, because the unrequited nature of that song was really an expression of a gay songwriter's inability to ever have an openly public relationship with the one they love, or they have an unrequited love for someone they know they'll never be able to be with. Um, and so we're able to go back in time and look at, and, and, and to some extent recontextualize the true deep meaning that happened within a song. And also there, there are some Motown songs that seem like they're just light and fluffy uh, pop tunes, but Motown itself was designed, it was built by Barry Gordy to literally change Americans' views of African Americans. So there's there's some context not in the specific song itself, but in the genre of music and in the overarching act of what it meant for the Supremes and the Four Tops to get out on stage after having their elocution lessons and their careful choreography and their clean cut suits. All of this was very carefully designed to literally change society. And so that's important to remember as well. Um, now you can look also at what a song meant in its original time and look at what it means now. So for instance, um, there's a wonderful song at the end of Annie Lennox's first solo album, the, her, her album Diva. And the song is Keep Young and Beautiful. And it's a song from the 1930s or so. And she sings it in, in a kind of a straightforward ma manner, but the lyrics are keep young and beautiful if you wanna be loved. And the entire song was just a pop song of the time basically. Uh, and now when we look back at those lyrics, they're horrifying. The idea that a woman couldn't be loved unless she was young and beautiful. And so she has to put on her makeup and dress up a certain way. Or in another song that I've uh, come across is uh, the Burt Bacharach song, Wives and Lovers, which uh, really says, you know, hey, little girl, fix your hair, put your makeup on and make sure you meet your husband at the door in your lingerie and have candles and wine going um, because He's at the office all day with secretaries. And if you don't, he's gonna end up running off with someone else. Maybe in the 60s, that was a hip thing to say. Now it's a pretty ridiculous and horrible message. So these songs, not what they meant during their time is different from what they mean now. So you should be choosing music based upon what you want to express emotionally and then go back through the lyrical meaning and the social context of its time and also what it means now. And sometimes a group discussion can be a really powerful way to you know, find the nooks and crannies and the nuance of the emotion of the song and then decide really what it's going to mean for you. Now, if you're choosing a song that's straightforward like Walking on Sunshine by Katrina and the Waves, I don't think you need to sit down and have a group discussion um, but uh, because it's about happiness and joy and sunshine, right? Done save yourself the time. But if it's a song about betrayal, there can be some real power, a song of loss. There can be some real power in having your group spend some time talking about their own loss because it might not be your own story that you find most powerful, but somebody else's that in the moment is able to trigger you. So there are a few different levels of one's ability to connect to a song uh, because it's important that you are able to find and harness the emotion within it um, from your own perspective. So the easiest songs are gonna be ones that you identify directly with, identification. This song could have been written by me. It sounds like it was about me. I had that exact experience, maybe a lyric or two are a little bit different, but 
a lot of songs that are written are are designed to be general enough that you're able to put yourself in those shoes. That's that's where the power of music often comes in. So that kind of immediate identification is is the easiest kind of song to slip on, right? It's like super comfortable, worn blue jeans. You just slip them on and boom, they're yours and off you go. Uh, the next easiest song would be one where you're, it's, it's, it just takes a measure of visualization. That specific thing hasn't happened to you, but it's happened to someone similar to you. You can imagine yourself in those shoes. It could have happened to you. Maybe you dodged a bullet and it would have happened to you unless you made some choices. Whatever it is, it's a song that, that you can make your own through a little bit of, of imagination. The third hardest, uh, and you know, as we're moving outside of the easiest songs, uh, the third one is a song that really wouldn't happen to you. It isn't yours, but if you take on a character, if you if you if you create a persona, much as someone does when they're on stage, then you're able to sing that song from that perspective, right? Um, this is a little bit maybe too playful of an example, but uh, the, the the old gold digger character of Eartha Kitt when she's singing Santa Baby, for instance, like. That's not you. You're not that kind of person, but you can become that kind of a person and take on that persona and play that role as you sing the song, which will be far more powerful than you trying to sing the song as yourself when you're actually not conniving and you know manipulative, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the fourth most difficult kind of song really is, is a song in which you can't even create a character in which you could easily put yourself to, to embody those emotions. And in that sense, it really requires a measure of substitution where you're just going to have to say, okay, this isn't me, this isn't my circumstance, this hasn't happened to me, but I know what those emotions are. I know what the, we want the audience to feel. So I'm going to elicit emotions that that align with those so that I'm able to be in the right moment and sharing the right emotions, even though they're not being shared really with me saying the words as if they're my own, even from a, pers a perspective of, of uh, you know, a character. Um, now, something else to know about songs is there are a couple of different kinds of tunes. There are songs that are entirely in one moment. So if you think about, uh, oh, what a beautiful morning, that's a song where at the beginning, it's a beautiful morning, at the end, it's a beautiful morning and all the way through uh, the song is singing about a beautiful morning, right? You're kind of like stuck in a moment of time. That's, that's what I call like a moment song. Uh, another kind of song is a plot song where it starts out in one place and then things unfurl and then by the end, boom, you realize you're in a completely different place and something has changed. The emotions change, the song swells and builds as there's a denouement and a realization or whatever. Um, those are two different kinds of, of songs. One, one really is about staying in one emotional place throughout. And the other one is about moving and shifting your emotions as it goes. Oh, I see, let's see, there's a little bit here. We often discuss the emotion or message and have different interpretations. Uh, do you have to agree or is it okay to be thinking about it differently? Excellent question, um, Jen. I would say you need, so there's a bandwidth. There's, there's a range within which it's okay to have people have different experiences and different ways of expressing a song. And sometimes a song, like if it's challenging or frustrating or whatever, um, can have a mixture of anger and sadness in there. You know, imagine a song from Les Mis where you're like holding the battalion, like you've got all the chairs upturned and, you know, war is coming and you, some people might be more sad and some might be more angry, some might be more fearful, right? But they're all correct within the, the telling of that story. So there, there can be um, some variety within there and, and, and have it absolutely work. The key is to make sure that nobody's at cross purposes, right? Uh, that that the, the people who are singing the song aren't saying something differently with it. And there's no hard and fast rule. There's no specific uh, way to determine like what's right other than to have you go through the process of singing a song. And, you know, something I'll mention at the end is you can videotape your performance or watch a group performance, obviously once, um, you know, once we're done with this COVID situation and everybody's able to be back together singing, um, you know, shoot some video and then watch yourself and watch everybody else and, and, and really look and see like, wow, you looked, I think you were trying to look intense there, but you looked mad or, uh, I think you were trying to express sadness, but it came across as boredom or, or autopilot or whatever. Like, like you, you can critique yourself and critique others to make sure that 
the way you're intending to express your emotion is actually how you're expressing it. And, you know, this brings up a side story um, moment that I had working on the sing-off in, in the big American television show that Pentatonix came from, et cetera. There was one group, it was actually often the jazz groups ensembles that I worked with that, um, that I had this problem with. There was a group and I would tell them like, guys, you, you need to express more. You need to be bigger with your gestures and your facial expressions. This is television and cameras will be right up on top of you, but still, everything is coming across as just being a little too cool and a little too subtle. And they were like, I, 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 I have to disagree. Like you, you don't understand, like inside it feels like we're being huge and it's just not like, it, it's just too much. And I was like, no, 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 I promise you. And finally I, I, I asked the director, I was like, can you play back their last performance? And I grabbed them and I brought them backstage to where there was a monitor and made them watch themselves. And immediately they all went, oh, because how it felt inside was different from how it felt on the outside. And that's a point uh, that, I'll, that I'll bring up a little later. I call that calibration, right? Making sure that the level at which you're expressing your emotion and feeling it is aligned with what's being received by the audience. And also so that it's in line with what the rest of the chorus is doing, right? Sometimes you'll have in, in chorus or quartet, you'll have you know one person who's super extroverted and really out there with her emotions and somebody else who's just super stiff and, and, and dialed back. And and as a director or as, as members of an ensemble, you'll want to talk about and, and, and get those calibrations right. So, so the person who's really holding back gives more and the person who's maybe really big makes a little more space and room for the others, um, unless you're a lead like I am, in which case it's all about you. So you do you, boo. I'm kidding, of course. Okay, so uh, moving on, um, something that you should know is there's a very strong emotional technical connection. Uh, you may not realize this, but the bottom line is that inside of uh, each mood are a lot of the choices that your director is trying to make you make anyway. When you're joyful, when you're happy, you smile and there's a brightness to your tone. There's an, a set of overtones that expresses joy. Uh, and this may seem like a little over overbearing, but it's not. Okay, so when you call somebody on the phone and they and they pick up the phone and they say hello, you can tell from their hello what their mood is. Down to the nuance, right? You can tell like, oh, they're, ha they're trying to be happy, but there's something wrong. Or they just woke up, but they're trying to pretend like they, they didn't, right? Like we're really good at being able to hear from one word somebody else's emotion. And the word is said by the same person at the, at the same speed, you know, the same part of their voice, more or less. Like it's really, it's really the facial expressions that are giving off a lot of what we're getting emotionally from them, right? And the reason I say this, especially for you directors, is if your singers are all, you know, angry or they're all joyful, they're all sad, they're all fearful, uh, or whatever the, the kind of second or tertiary level emotion they're ex expressing is, you're going to already have them expressing and phrasing and their vowels and their facial structure will already be more aligned. One of the most powerful tools I have when I'm, when I'm coaching and I'm working with groups is to get them to on the same page emotionally. And as soon as they start performing it that way, all of a sudden, shunk, the song's in better tune. It sounds contrary because they're not thinking about the tuning anymore. They're just doing it. But in, in the same way that, uh, you know, uh, Yoda says, <laughs> do or do not, there is no try. I just watched Mandalorian last night, so I've got Star Wars on the brain. But um, the, the act of doing something needs to be one that happens almost in a second nature and confidence. If, if a baseball player or cricket player, if you will, since, since uh, I'm speaking with so many of my British friends, um, is thinking about their stance and their swing and their posture while they're playing, they're not going to do as well. They need to be in the moment, trust their instincts, trust their training, trust the mechanics that they know, and be focused on the ball, be focused on the moment, be focused on the task at hand. That's what we're trying to get everybody to do within, within your group. And um, you really, when they're on stage, you don't want people to be just um, uh, focusing on the technical aspects. Oh, no, I need to make sure there's a C sharp. Wait, am I quiet enough here or whatever? Because then the song is half about fear of doing something wrong and half about like just technique. They're up in their heads. They're not expressing that emotion. Okay. So another thing to think about is the fact that uh, when an actor is on stage, they're singing something 
for the first time, they're saying something for the first time. They're, they're expressing things. You know, if there's a surprise party, the person who walks in on stage, surprise, they need to genuinely be surprised for the first time. And that's something that we need to be able to get across right away. And in fact, let's talk a little bit about that. Let's talk about the act of, um, of, of theater actors because a lot of how we're gonna be able to get these emotions to come out of our singers is through what is called the method or method acting, Stanislavski in training, which is how the great actors in the world, the Robert De Niro's and the Meryl Streep's and uh, Al Pacino's, et cetera, et cetera. This is the technique they use, um, which is basically to have some kind of what they call a sense memory um, for each one of their uh, moments. So um, let's talk about joy. Joy is the easiest one because it's not scary. People feel comfortable in, in public sharing that. So think about something that's joyful for you. Maybe it's Christmas morning. Maybe it's when you picked up your puppy or you had your child or a grandchild or you fell in love or whatever it is. What's, what's a joyful moment for you? And have that moment at your fingertips. So right before you sing a song, your director or whoever's playing the pitch or whatever um, says like, this is gonna be the song and immediately joy. You think about this joy and you let that joy flood you emotionally. And then you're singing the song with that joy inside of you. And it's important for you to, to, to go through the process of for each one of your songs, having some kind of a memory, sense memory, some emotion that you're able to dig up and use to put you in that song, particularly if you have a set of songs. If, you, if you're going boom, 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 boom through different songs, different emotions, different moments, and only a couple uh, seconds between each song or someone's delivering the introduction and talking about it, you need to get yourself into that moment. And that's where these sense memories become very powerful. So I noticed in the chat someone wrote, joyful moment, convention. I totally agree. Oh, yes. I can't wait till we can all get together again and sing and, you know, woodshed and sing tags until the, the, the wee hours in the morning and laugh and be silly and see old friends, and make new ones. Yeah, it's coming. It's coming. This is testing us. But uh, hopefully, my hope is that uh, at the end of all of this, there's going to be so much of a need for people to connect and be together again. And they're going to be so sick of Netflix and so sick of Zoom that they're going to come flooding to vocal harmony, both uh, new members joining joining choirs, joining choruses, joining quartets, whatever, and also um, coming to concerts because they want that live experience. They want that connection. And that's all the more reason that we need to make sure that our performances are emotionally powerful for them because people don't care about tuning. They don't care about the specific notes. Uh, at the end of a long day, you don't say, oh, I just want to listen to the most technically precise piece of music I own, right? You, you want to hear a song that either helps you vent this frustration or you know, puts you in this happy mood or helps you relax or whatever it is. That's what we need to make our music for other people. We need to make it that emotional gift, that powerful, transformative experience, rather than try to make it um, some you know, showcase where we end up just being technically perfect and like, oh, look, they sang perfectly in tune. Well, that's nice for them, right? Like it's 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 almost kind of crystalline and distant, right? It's like that painting in the gallery that's really good, but doesn't make you feel anything, right? Be the other painting that elicits a strong emotion. That I think is how we make barbershop uh, a huge thing, how we take it back into people's homes and into their lives um, as soon as possible. So um, let's see, moving on. Um, Okay, with all of this and with your sense memory and with the individual members of your group having discussed a song and knowing what it is and, and, and feeling it, there are a couple things uh, that, are, that are important to know. Number one is your biggest enemy is autopilot. And I think you all know what I'm talking about, where you start singing a song and la di da di da and then all of a sudden you start to fade out and you're thinking about dinner time or your mind, mind is wandering to this, wandering to that, and then nobody's home right? You're singing the right notes and the right rhythms, which is actually proof that you can trust your instinct, but your brain isn't there. You're not actually in the moment and engaged, right? That's the worst because what you're literally doing is the lights get shut off and you're not emotionally there. And that has a rippling effect through a chorus. Other people can, can have their emotions shut off or whatever. And then, uh, and then the audience is left with nothing. 
Now, I find this to be less the case in barbershop and more the case in choral music, for instance. Like, how many times have you looked up in the risers and there are just people up there with dull, glazed looks and then they're singing? And even if it sounds pretty, it feels kind of empty or robotic because we don't have that powerful emotional connection with them, right? I need my, uh, I need my tea, my Twining's tea. Okay, so um, now the thing that I will say uh, with Barbershop though, is that something I've observed is a strong, powerful desire to have everybody expressing emotion powerfully. And as a result, people are doing the things that look like they're happy. They're they have huge grins on their faces and they're moving in really big gestures. And yet to have a bunch of people uh, going through the gestures of acting like they're happy when they're not actually happy, it's like that phone call I was talking about and someone says hello and you can tell the person's not happy but they're trying to act like they're happy. It ends up having the opposite effect. It ends up not really grabbing people and touching their hearts and making them feel actual joy. Now, joy is an easier one because I think once you get up on the risers, if you're having a good time, that's gonna come through the music, right? It's, it's harder to get into nuanced emotions of, of melancholy and, and sadness and, and, and uh, you know, the, the grayer emotions, right? But they have to actually be there. It's not just enough to kind of drop the corners of your mouth and, and sing like this. Like, if you're really in that moment, you can create a very powerful transformative experience for the audience. Anyway, I'm just, I'm, I'm cautioning you from acting like you're feeling the emotion. This isn't about acting like you're feeling the emotion. And the whole, um, all of these things that we're taking from the theater world are not about trying to act. It's about experiencing it, right? And that's why Meryl Streep is a great actress because when you see her performance, you believe it because she believes it because it's inside of her at that moment, right? She's not just mimicking and putting it on, right? And you can tell those actors who either can only play themselves or uh, like you go back in time and you see people who are acting and they're just, they're, they're going through the motions and they're, it's almost like a pantomime, right? It's like a big morality play, but you don't really believe the nuances of their performance. Um, we want our audiences to truly believe us. Okay, so, uh, Couple things, oh, let's see, question. How do you get folks who cannot communicate the emotive experiences? Well, I think they can. I think everybody can, right? Um, there are a couple people on this planet who are tone deaf, but they're almost like, they're like four of them, right? They literally cannot differentiate pitch, right? It's like a brain problem. There are some people who are not capable of experiencing or expressing any emotion. Now. There are people who are sociopaths who actually are freed of emotion and you know, hopefully they're not, they don't go on to be a menace to society, but even they are pretty good, sometimes too good at um, expressing emotions and or at least seeming like they are. And then they go on to run cults and you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but I don't think that these are the people that we're dealing with in our choruses and choirs. I think that what we're dealing with are people who might be emotionally more closed off. You know, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from the word repressed. Um, they're people who have been walled off or told that emotions are not able to be as forward. And, and uh, you know, and you do see this um, both in, in, in traditionally in male roles or in female roles, there are certain gender appropriate emotions that are allowed, right? Uh, at least traditionally in culture, women have been more allowed to express sadness and men have been more allowed to express anger. But these concepts are ridiculous. Everybody has all emotions and should be allowed to, to express them. Also, it is not, <laughs> it doesn't go uh, unnoticed by me that uh, British culture in general has an element of stiff upper lip and also tall poppy syndrome where between the two, you're trying to fit in Right, which is the case in, in many island nations, such as Japan or whatever. We have a lot of people on a, on a single rock and y'all got to get along. So that makes sense. So there's a lot of courtesy and a lot of politeness. So it's about often about uh, subsuming your emotion to the needs of the greater uh, group. Um, and so you get locked into that, like, nope, everything's fine when it's not actually fine, but you've been taught 
to show that it's fine and maybe even begin to believe that it's fine. So in this sense, it's important to exercise your emotion. And this is the next point I was gonna to get to. In rehearsal, I don't believe that you should be focusing on notes and rhythms and dynamics and then at the end working on, on emotion. No, I think when it's the, the second a piece of new music is handed out, you talk about the emotion. What does it mean? Every single time you're making decisions about dynamics and tuning and blend and, and, and focus of vowels and all of that, it should be in service of that highest goal, the emotion. What are we trying to say? What are we trying to feel? And then directors never say, let's just take it from the top. Let's just run it. Never allow your group to sing the song without the emotion. Now, this may mean you end up choosing a different song because you don't want to just be going through the heartache of this incredibly difficult piece of music every single time. So, you know, choose your repertoire wisely and build up a tolerance and an ability to go into the difficult emotions. But you should be singing with emotion every single time you sing a song. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're exercising this muscle of no emotion, and then you're expecting when you get on stage, all of a sudden the emotion's gonna be there. But people don't know how to do that. So they're gonna fall back to this place of being worried about the notes and rhythms and focusing on the director and doing the moves they're supposed to be doing. But that's not the most powerful thing. In fact, I'm sure all of you would agree that it's far more powerful and far more satisfying to watch a performance that has a couple mistakes in it and then it's emotionally engaging and powerful rather than one that's technically perfect, but cold, right? And, and, and if you look at great music, great live performances, great recordings, there are imperfections in them and those make them great. You go back and you listen to Motown by today's standards, a lot of it's out of tune. You listen to the greatest jazz album of all time, at least by record sales, which is Miles Davis's Kind of Blue, and you hear him squelching notes on it, right? So this is the confidence of a performer who isn't worried about every single note being perfect. He's worried about conveying an expression and an emotion. It's his album. He could have used the take where he didn't make a little flub on it, but he wasn't worried about that. He wanted it to be right. And to be right and to be human is sometimes to have those little errors in there. In fact, uh, the best moments in Saturday Night Live and in, in Whose Line Is It Anyway or any of those improv comedy shows or whatever, a lot of the best moments often are when something unexpected happens or someone flubs the line or someone comes up with something that's not known. And, and all of a sudden it's like, everybody's really in the moment and what's happening right then is absolutely true. And even though there's a mistake, it really like locks everybody in the performance together and it becomes the biggest laugh line. It becomes the biggest, most powerful moment. Don't be afraid of imperfection. Embrace it as part of the humanity that makes the human voice the most powerful instrument of all, right? We could listen to synthesizer music all day that's programmed by computers and it's flawless and nobody wants to hear that. They want your heart. They want your little imperfections. They want the little gravel and the scratchiness in your voice, right? That's what makes Ray Charles so amazing, right? They want a little flub in, in one of Ella Fitzgerald's unbelievable um, scat solos because then they hear that and they're like, God, she really is improvising this. That's happening right now. She's doing that, right? So just know that the audience wants that. It takes a little bit of the weight off your shoulders, both as singers and as directors. You don't have to be perfect. In fact, nobody wants you to be perfect. They want you to be real. And that's the thing that's most important about expressing emotion. La, 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 la. Let's see. Um, exercise or exorcise. Well, it is Halloween. So at least here in America, since we're big on all the demons, we'll go with exorcise today and spit some pea soup and spin our head around. And then tomorrow, maybe we'll... We'll go with exercise. Uh, let's see here. Um, another question. What's the implication for modern pop, which is so synthetically pitch perfect? <laughs> Pun intended. I get it. Yeah. Um, is it less emotional impact? Ooh, uh, double layers, two different layers there. Okay. So as someone who's older and somebody who loves older, more traditional music, I listen to swing and, you know, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s music all of the time, most of the time. Um, I prefer live bands. I prefer the warmth and the richness and the imperfection pre-autotune music. And for me, music started driving off a cliff, even though I was in high school at the time, uh, during the 1980s when things became so synthesized and drum machines. In fact, I even, uh, I would have conversations with the, the manager of the Nylons uh, because I love the group and they were an inspiration to me growing up, but I just don't think the drum machine worked because it was too inhuman. It was kind of robotic and it just, I'm like, vocal percussion hadn't been developed by then. They needed something like, 
I love those old recordings, don't get me wrong, but there's a reason nobody does it anymore. Nobody sings a cappella to a drum machine. It's too robotic. It's not human. It doesn't work. It's not great. Fact, um, so anyway, that is to say, I think that a lot of what's happening in current popular music is uh, too roboticized, too locked down. And actually some of the biggest artists that break through, um, be it Adele or Lizzo or Ed Sheeran, like it's their humanity that comes through, right? They put themselves out there emotionally and sitting on top of all of this super perfect tuned stuff, their humanity comes through. So I, I do think that we're in a bit of a, of a dip, a nadir when it comes to pop songwriting right now, because things are built so much around uh, four chord patterns, you know, producers are kind of creating this track and someone just kind of sings they, over it. I need yeah. to interrupt you. I need to interrupt Please. you. We have got five minutes left. It's okay. an organizational thing. So, uh, if you could think about that, please, we really would appreciate it. I will, I will. Okay, so just to get to the end of that uh, comment, um, I think it's like the 1950s with four chord patterns and we're gonna get back to where we're going emotionally. Um, last couple things, uh, I talked a little bit about calibration. Make sure that you spend some time with video and getting the different people in your group locked in together. Um, directors, use empowering language. This isn't about, I need you guys to sing this. It's, uh, we want to do this together. Do your best to erode inhibitions within your group and, and make it a safe space for everybody to sing. And also remind people that the concept of bravery isn't always about having swords and slaying dragons, but it's about emotional honesty and openness. And it's those first people who really are able to open their themselves up in front of your chorus that have the ability to transform the entire room and your entire group's ability to, to share. So those are, those are important stage setting um, situations. Uh, be very careful of your own inner critic uh, that, that, that uh, will, will take you down a notch and, and use your knowledge of the fact that nobody wants it to be perfect to allow yourself to make those mistakes and to take that risk with the emotion, which really is what makes so much of our favorite music so powerful. Um, uh, uh, know that there are times when emotions are going to become overwhelming for your singers and it's okay if people need to take a moment in a rehearsal, if someone starts crying or whatever, um, there's that classic uh, Tom Hanks line in, in uh, League of Their Own when he's the, the, the baseball manager of the, of the women's baseball teams during World War II. And he says, there's no crying in baseball. I like to say there's always crying in acapella, right? If you don't cry at some point, you're doing it wrong, right? You've got to be on the edge of sharing your emotion and sometimes it becomes overwhelming. Sometimes also you may go overboard and it's too much and, and you just, you need to, you need to go across the line to know where the line is and to find that place. You, you may find yourself in rehearsals just becoming and, and playing with where that you're overwhelmed and you can't like hold back the emotion and the tears. Do that enough so that you know where that is so you can get up to that line time and again. That's what I mean by exercising this, this muscle of emotion so that when you get in front of people, it's second nature. And then of course it takes some time to recharge as well, recharge your emotions and your experiences and your batteries. Um, one more concept before uh, I hand it over for questions, and that is directors. It is not your job to pull the emotions out of your singers. This is where we go back to that Aesop's fable, right? You're setting the stage for them to take off their own coat. You can't take their coat off, right? Um, and, and, and singers, you may think like, well, you know, it really helps when the director's in the front waving her hands and smiling and pulling all this, whatever. No, 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 no don't make her responsible and don't put it on her to, to have to pull this emotion out of you, right? It doesn't work any more than it worked when you were young and you were walking around the mall in a, in a, in a pouty mood and, you're, and your mother turns you like, come on, cheer up, what's the matter? Like, nobody can tell you to cheer up from the outside. You have to decide that you're gonna cheer up. So directors, stop trying to pull the emotion out of your singers, just be your own selves. And singers, it's on you. You have to be responsible for your own emotion. And then when that happens, um, the lights start turning on in, in the chorus, and then you get this wave of emotion because the people who are less brave or more afraid or, or more inhibited start to get swept up in the emotion that's being experienced and shared from everyone else around them, okay? Hopefully that's really helpful, especially to directors. And many a director I've worked with is like, thank you. I've been trying to pull so much. It's so exhausting to have to try to pull all the emotion out. Deke, we, yep. need Paula, we need Paula to wrap up here now for you, please. Oh, okay. It's oh, wrap-up time. Deke, we could listen to you for the rest of the evening and more. It's, that's been an absolutely fabulous. Clap Deke, everybody. Clap Deke. Yay. 
Thank you, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everyone. So sorry we could have more of your time. One last question, one last question for one of our very young barbershop singers who's watching, um, Maya. I hope I've said your name right, Maya. She wants to know what's your favorite Pitch Perfect song? Oh, uh, ooh, that's tough. I love all my babies. <laughs> um, uh, I will say this. I think Das Sound Machine won the second movie. I realize that doesn't go with the storyline and the plot, but I do think Das Sound Machine, the Germans won this round, yes. Uh, so their performances are pretty, pretty great. And in fact, I'm one of the vocalists on their stuff. So maybe I'm biased. I sang with a German accent. Yeah. Anyway. Um, yeah. Beautiful. Thanks, Steve. There you are, Thank you all. Question. Contact me, find me online. If you have any questions, if I can help with anything, say the word. Thank you Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Everyone, speak away. We need very Thank quick photos. Very Thank quick you. photos. Very Brilliant. quick photos. And again, keep waving. Keep waving. <laughs> Keep waving. We're going in for the second one. <laughs> Thanks, people. Thank you, Deke. We're off. I'm so going to cut the stream. Okay, good.